Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by uh, three of my colleagues. Uh, we've got Chris, Chris Dorides, Deputy Chief Mark. Economist. We've got Ryan, Ryan Sweet. He's the Director of Real-Time Economics. And Eric, Eric Gauss. Eric, you've not been on Inside Economics. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, who, who made that error? That, <laughs> you know, that doesn't sound right to me. You know, we've been on the air now, I think, almost a year, if not if not a year, pretty close. Well, not close. Yeah. I mean, it's taken a year to get you on uh, Inside Economics. That's that's a we got to talk to the booker here for these. You, you keep me busy all the time, Mark. I don't, I don't have time. Oh, oh, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. You're too busy for you're too busy for Inside Economics. Did you hear that, guys? He uh, says he's too busy. He's a busy guy. He's a busy, yeah, he's guy. A busy guy. So what's your title exactly? Uh, I'm a senior economist. Okay. And, uh, you know, you are critical to a lot of the work we do around geopolitical risk, uh, uh, country risk, as we as we say. There's no difference between country risk and geopolitical risk, is there? Uh, yeah, I would say, that, I mean, geopolitical risk is sort of <laughs> underneath uh, country risk. Country risk is really broad. I mean, it, it runs the gamut from everything that, you know, could possibly... Uh, Okay. go wrong okay makes sense so geopolitical risk is a subset of Correct. what you would call country risk okay right very good so what else would be in country what other kinds of things would be in country risk well we'd look at things like uh national security risk which includes things like uh effects of climate change right it's not geopolitical at all um social risks which is mostly the kinds of uh uh you know, social unrest locally, right? So thinking about like an Arab Spring type moment um, that might precipitate to, to sort of more unrest. Um, there's of course political risk and tied into there is of course geopolitical risk. Um, we also have three other main dimensions that are more economic. So macro, um, macro risk, business risks and financial risks, which are more sort of like the currency and um, you know, bond market side of things. Got it. Got it. And you, you before you came to Moody's, uh, you were you were in an academic, right? Were you at Gettysburg? Yeah. You were teaching at Gettysburg. No, no that's where Mark was from. Uh, oh. but also nearby, a uh, small liberal arts college uh, or sinus college. Oh, sure. Uh, and yeah. then I also taught at Haverford College um, oh. about a year before I started. MOD. The Centennial Conference, which is Haverford, Gettysburg, and where I went to college, Washington College, is very well represented here at Moody's. Yeah. Say that again. What, what's well represented here, at Moody's? The Centennial Conference, which includes a bunch of small liberal arts schools. So Gettysburg, where uh, Hopkins, Mark Hopkins taught, Haverford, Ursinus, Eric, <laughs> Ursinus, and I went to undergrad at Washington College, which is also in the Centennial Conference. Oh, I I, I didn't know that. Oh, that's a little a, fun that's fact cool. there. Yeah, it yeah. is a fun fact. Yeah, yeah. very good. So the it's the Centennial Conference. Mm -hmm. I mean, a little bit by extension, you can include. Chris, because uh, Johns Hopkins is mm -hmm. D3 in baseball, and we would play Hopkins. So Gettysburg or Sinus in my school would play Hopkins. Oh. Would you, oh now you got to get the UPenn connection. You can't there. get the UPenn in there. No? That's no. that now. We're, we're, we're a class of our own. There you go. There you go. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Someone's got to call soon. Uh, no, no, no. We need no. a bigger box for Mark's area. Yeah, I know. He's not going to fit in it soon. <laughs> he's right. Yeah, he's, he's absolutely right. Um, fighting colonials. <laughs> that we are. Well, no. we, we're the Quakers, not the Quakers. Quakers. Quakers, not the well, colonials. <laughs> it shows you what I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, uh, Eric, how long have you been with us at Moody's now? Up on four years. This summer will be four years. Well, fantastic. It's good to have you aboard. And obviously, we're going to be talking about geopolitical risk, and there's a lot of risk out there uh, to talk about a lot of things going on yeah a lot of things going on so it's good to have you uh on board uh to have this this conversation but before we uh, we get to that we i guess we should talk about it. there's a few things going on in the economy financial markets that are just really bothering me and i you know i'm just gonna throw it out there and see what people think and help me understand what's going on uh first up um the stock market <clears throat> what in the world? Uh, the Federal Reserve is on DEFCON 1, you know, can't seem to tell us they're going to be raising rates any more 
quickly, they're just going to ramp things up here. You know, every speech uh, uh, Chair Powell has given or another Fed governor has given is just, well, we're going to be tightening very aggressively here going forward. Uh, and then on top of that, we have Russia, Ukraine, uh, and all the uncertainty and macroeconomic consequences of that, none of which are any good. Yet the stock market, no problem. I mean, a I, yeah, a what's the deal? Does that make any sense to you guys? What's going on? Anyone got a view? Chris, you got a view on that? Uh, it's, I agree with you. It doesn't make any real logical uh, sense. Uh, all I can think of is that maybe there is a cash on the sidelines. So as soon as you get any type of a uh, little bit of a decline, people come in and bargain shop. And that's why it's not, it's not reacting, but it, that doesn't really hold water. If you really believe that the rates are on the, are, are going uh, up uh, quickly. So I don't know. I don't so know. You're perplexed as well. Yes. Yes. Well, well did, did this, I mean, before I said it, had this, had you noticed this? Was this like something like what's going on here in your own mind or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, okay. prices are up. I mean, it, it doesn't seem, nothing seems, it doesn't seem to react. It just, uh, right. Stock market continues on its way. So. And Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of the case across the globe, right? I mean, equity markets pretty much everywhere. They're down a little bit from their peaks, but they're all time peaks. But they're not down a lot. They're, they're down in some, like like the FTSE 250, which is the uh, British uh, equity index. That's down more than the S and P 500 in the U.S., which you know that makes some sense, given that they're more closely linked to what's going on in Russia, Ukraine. But markets across the globe seem to be hanging in pretty well. Do, is that right? I think I got so that. Right. That's pretty true. I mean, yeah, you're right. They're, they've all slid a little bit, but you know, compared to the sort of enormity of the situation, it doesn't seem like it's the right scale. Um, right. And right. I think that's more what you're thinking, right? Right. Ryan, any perspective on this? What's going I on? I agree with everybody. Particularly, you know, if you look over the last several months, I mean, valuations, you know, we've been arguing going into this that the stock market was overvalued and the only thing justifying these high valuations was low interest rates. And now that interest rates are on the rise, you would think valuations will you know, start to be readjusted and that the stock market should come in with it. But so far it's holding up. I mean, I don't know how people are that optimistic about earnings growth next year, given that the Fed is, like you said, on DEFCON 1. I mean, you know, I, I just don't see how the stock market can hold up. Is it yeah. a lack of alternatives? Or where else are you going to go? Maybe. But well, I mean, you have seen a lot of outflows of leveraged loans. Maybe that money's going into the stock market or you know, people are looking for alternatives like Chris point. Oh, what, what's that, Ryan? Uh, leverage the leverage loan market. Loan market? Yeah. You know, if you look at the corporate bond market, the, right. the investment grade corporate bond issue, a lot of demand for investment grade, but high yield and leverage loans, there's been some really significant slowing in demand for uh, that kind of uh, paper. Maybe they're bailing on that and going, into, this is all a, a hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, it could be going into the stock market yeah, the two point six trillion dollars in excess savings. Maybe the retail investors coming in because it's with the high end income households. I don't know. I mean, we're kind of scrambling for explanations. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one of those things. Usually, when I can't explain it, it doesn't last very long. <laughs> so, feels like we might wake up one morning and the Dow Jones is down a thousand points or something. It just feels that way. Does you know? Here, here's the other thing. The Federal Reserve will, clearly wants the economy's growth rate to slow, right? Because they're yeah. fearful that the economy is going to blow past full employment and these, these, uh, this high inflation and inflation expectations is going to get embedded, endemic, and they got a bigger problem down the road with, you know, with uh, trying to battle that. So they're clearly telling us point blank, no questions, no uncertainty, we are going to slow growth. And one of the key ways to slow growth, at least anytime in the near future, is through lower stock prices, right? I mean, you know, clearly the housing market, you know, that's interest rate sensitive and that's showing some cracks. But if you don't get stock prices down, then the Fed's going to even have to step on the brakes even harder, right? I mean, they're, they're going to win at some point. They'll win this battle, won't they? Do you think it's more important for the stock prices to come down or for them to cause corporate bond spreads to widen? So, you know, reduce access to credit. 
Well, or it could be both. I mean, it's probably yeah, a have you ever seen both. a situation where stock prices stay no. where, stay strong and corporate bond spreads no. gap out? Yeah, that's Does a good that point. Happen? There's a very strong correlation between the two. Of them. Well, for good reason, right? They're, right, exactly. Yeah, but I'm wondering, yeah, if the Fed pushes hard enough that one of them will crack first. Well, I don't you, know which you, one. you follow the corporate bond market really carefully. So, what about what's going on with corporate credit spreads? That's the difference between yields on corporate bonds and say ten-year Treasury a risk-free rate. That spread that uh, corporate bond spread is a, is a reflection of what bond investors need to get compensated for the risk involved, the credit risk involved right. in investing in that bond, the risk that that bond might default or they might not get paid in a timely way. Has it, that's what's going on there. Is that similar? Are you similarly surprised there with how yeah. you are? Okay. Yeah, so the increase in the bond market volatility, the stock market volatility, you know, typically those are two big drivers of high yield corporate bond spreads, but they've widened. You know, not an enormous amount, not a, but part of it is because the stock market's held up. And if you look at, you know, since the 1990s, there's a very strong correlation and causal relationship between changes in the stock market and high yield corporate bond spreads. So they're, they actually came in over the past week, which was a little bit surprising. And we're well below our historical average. So usually a historical average for high yield corporate bond spread is 500 basis points. I think we're still below 400 basis points. Yeah. Mm. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Hey, uh, Eric, uh, this may be a question you don't know the answer to, but it doesn't stop me from asking it anyway. Uh, do historically, do geopolitical events have significant impacts on uh, equity prices on on corporate bond spreads on financial markets? Are they can you see it uh, when we have big events in markets? Give you a classic economist answer. It depends, <laughs> right? So, right. So Ryan, Ryan so says that all the time. By the way, <laughs> yeah, right. That's his. That's his go-to. Oh, it depends. Well, uh, but I think it's it's somewhat true. It depends on how localized you're talking about, right? So, so, like, clearly, we'll see this for Russia and Ukraine, and maybe like the closer you get to the epicenter of whatever the geopolitical uh, turmoil happens to be, that's where you're going to see more response, and that that sort of follows intuition. Um, so right. yeah, it, it does kind of depend. Well, I guess the Russian stock market was shut down. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. Round zero for this mess. So right. yeah. I mean, the one thing I can point out. Ripple out. Go ahead, Brian. But the one thing I point out is that the Federal Reserve has a geopolitical uh, risk index. And, you know, I recently looked at it and kind of see assess, you know, does it affect the economy more or financial markets? It affects financial market conditions much more in the U.S. economy, so so far, the hit to the stock market, the hit to high yield corporate bond spreads, is in line with what we saw around the Iraq War, less so around 9/11, but the Gulf War, things like that. You know, you just took my statistic. No, you, you, sure. You're going to cite the <laughs> geopolitical risk index. I was. No, I was. I'm not kidding. What is it? What is it right now? What's the Four. number? Four. 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 The Z score. The Z score. Yeah. Is okay. Four. Yeah. Right. The, the Z yeah, score sure. is four. Yeah. Right. Am yeah, I he's okay? Looking, he's looking well, at where's the cowbell? <laughs> where's the cowbell? There's no cowbell for <laughs> that. That was the game in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you want to explain that the, the whole because this is something you do. You put this together. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to explain that to and Eric? I should ask. Do you look at what Ryan puts together here on on this? No, Z -score? you can say no. It's okay. It's. Well, no, oh, that's a no. no, no this, that is a no. That is a no. That, that's silence. the one that that comes from uh, the the Giacobelli paper, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, explain that, Ryan, Go, or Eric. Explain that statistic of what ahead, it's Ryan. saying and put it into some kind of context. So you know, uh... so what the the Fed economist did is very similar to what uh, uh, Stanford economists Bloom and others did for uh, political uncertainty. Uh, what they do is like. You know, they scrape newspapers and look for references to geopolitical risk. Uh, I don't know all the exact terms that they look for, but things that are tied to you know, geopolitical risk, like war, sanctions, things like that. And they come up with an index. And what I did was I calculated a Z-score, which shows you how far above or below the mean it is. And right now it's, at, as you mentioned, four, which is among the highest sense. Uh, uh, I think it was the Iraq war. But it was a lot higher than in the Iraq Yeah, it was. War. We're not there yet. Which is, you know, I think it was more like, uh, or maybe it was a financial crisis. It was uh, eight. Was it the financial crisis? No. Was it 
Was no, it I'm sorry, 9-11, right. That was double what it is now, which I guess makes mm -hmm. sense. Makes because we're sense. not explicitly involved in what's going on with Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, right. Good point. And so what you're saying is based on your analysis that if you relate that geopolitical risk measure, that Z-score, as you describe it, to financial market conditions, stock prices, credit spreads, and economic some measure of economic activity, presumably, I guess, GDP or jobs, you mm -hmm. find that it's much more important for financial markets than it is for Correct. the economy, which I guess makes sense. But right now, no, you can't connect the dots here, right? Because financial markets are really not- They've tightened. I think they've tightened you know, noticeably over the last month, but- Yeah, you know, maybe, but- Not to the degree maybe that we're thinking that they should have. Well, and wouldn't they have a tightened just if, if forget about Russia, Ukraine, if only the Fed did what it was yeah, doing yes. and every central yeah. bank on the planet now is almost every central bank, except the Bank of China is kind of tightening policy, you would have expected, you know, something, but in you see some tightening in financial conditions, right? Yeah, so, I would only push back that the Fed would not be on DEFCON 1. Powell would not have said what he said earlier this week if it wasn't for... Russia, Ukraine, which led to higher oil prices, which has pushed okay. up inflation expectations. So okay, if you didn't have that, it would be yeah. more steady, you know, steady as she goes. That's a great point. That's a great point. The reason why the Fed went from DEFCON 5 to DEFCON 1 seemingly in a few weeks was, the in fact, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because that fanned inflation and more importantly, inflation expectations, and thus, uh, I see, yeah, Correct. that makes a lot of sense. So Russia, Ukraine is... One way or the other, you know, it feels like it's kind of at the root of what's what's going on here. But still, exactly. even even despite that, it not it hasn't had that big an impact uh, on financial markets. Certainly not one. It's confusing. It's just confusing. We haven't mm -hmm. seen more of an impact. Okay. All right. Um, here's another one uh, that uh, is bothering me. Uh, and and I'm, I might turn this back on you guys and ask you what's bothering you, but. I got because there's a, a lot of things that are bothering me now uh, about the all of a sudden uh, the shape of the yield curve, uh, mm -hmm. the yield curve. And, you know, someone asked about Ryan, sent an email to Ryan and myself a few days ago about what we thought about what the yield curve is saying. And uh, I, I characterized my view as I'm a yield curve um what did I say? I'm a yield curve believer, and Ryan's a yield curve denier. Do I have that right, Ryan? Do, is that right? Right? Skeptic. Oh, you're skeptic. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. that's a better word. You're right. Yeah, skeptic. Yeah. I should have said skeptic. Yeah, that was better characterization. But okay, so so who wants uh, Ryan? You want to describe what's going on with the yield curve and what the debate is about about what the yield curve is saying? Yeah. So the yield curve is the difference between long-term treasury securities, typically the 10-year treasury yield, and a measure of short-term interest rates. So you can look at the two-year treasury yield or the three-month treasury bill. Uh, historically, the most accurate measure of the yield curve is the 10-year minus the three-month. That has only sent one false signal, uh, meaning that it inverted and we avoided a recession, and that was back in the 1960s. So right now, there's it's the tail of two yield curves. So the one that... Uh, everyone's focused on is the 10-year minus the two-year, and that has uh, flattened quite substantially. I think last time I checked, it was less than 25 basis points. I think it was 20 uh, basis points, 20 point, okay. percentage points yesterday. But... So it's not inverted yet, meaning that short-term rates aren't higher than long-term rates, but we're headed that way. And if you look at forward uh, treasury curve, they expect that to invert in the next six months. On the other hand, the 10-year minus the three-month is nowhere near inversion. It's a, It's it's actually the gap between the two of these are the widest in a very, very long time. So you're getting a message, you know, tail of two yield curves. So uh, we maintain a probability of recession uh, based on the daily yield curves. So the 10-2 has the probability of recession in the next 12 months, close to 20%. The 10-year minus the three month, 7%. So it really depends on what yield curve you put more stock in. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly the the three month is going to be rising here very rapidly. It will be. That's yep. going to do. So it's almost like you really shouldn't. That, that just feels a little odd to be looking at that as, as trying to understand where the curve is going to be. I mean, the ten, the two year is a more of a market investor reflection of where the Fed's going, and so it feels like that's probably a better indicator to look at gauge to gauge where we're headed mm -hmm. or what the risks are. Would you agree with that? No. 
uh, I think, yeah, right now it is, but like, yeah. before, yeah. If, yeah. If, if, if the 10 yeah. 2 inverts and the 10 3, it's headed towards inversion, but yeah. a recession usually follows after the 10 3 inverts. Well, although I showed you this chart, if you look back to uh, business cycles, I think going all the way back to the 19, 1980s uh, recessions, we had two back to back. The 10 year, two year on a monthly basis inverted prior to each of those recessions. Yeah. And I don't think mm -hmm. it ever inverted in a recession not happen. Even it even inverted before the pandemic. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. And, and you could say, well, doesn't that mean that this is a false indicator because who who could have predicted the pandemic? That's true, but I would have argued that the economy was pretty fragile and pretty high probability of going into recession even without the pandemic because of the trade war. Yeah. You did argue that. I did argue that. <laughs> I did argue that. Yeah, exactly. Chris, Chris, what do you think of the... So maybe I'll turn to you. Can you explain why the shape of the yield curve and when it inverts when long short-term rates rise above long rates that is so pre prescient in terms of recessions you know what what's behind that what what is there some causal relationship or you know what is what, what's going on there why 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 is this such a oppression indicator yeah well uh, i guess a couple of things we could say uh, first of all i'll say i, I am a believer um a believer? <laughs> yeah um I'm only on my a strong believer i'm a strong believer strong believer okay yeah with me and we're going to ask to Eric, what, is he a believer yeah. or a denier or a skeptic soon? So uh, get ready. Well, I'll take Chris's normal position. I'm going to be right in the middle. Of, of course. Oh, yeah. I'm abandoning Which, that we, position, well, so it's you all yours. <laughs> how do you describe that then? You're a... Well, because it, it works very well to describe the U.S., but it doesn't work very well in other countries. And so that so it, it may be conditional on the sort of financial system, the structure of the financial system and how that sort of works. So in... That, that's sort of my stance or, on it. or the well functioning of the bond market right because you have to have a it, very yeah exactly liquid... exactly the fun, the what the financial system and the bond markets look like yeah because yeah, if you have no you know because we have a very liquid treasury market i mean right. and it's the risk-free it's risk-free there is no credit risk in there right whereas other places yeah. you don't have the same liquidity in those markets and there probably is some credit risk in a lot of them but it, but anyway abstracting from that going back to chris so what's the logic here what what's the intuition so in terms of a causal relationship, I would point to the uh, uh, banking system or, or, or lending, right? Under a, an inverted yield curve, right? it's very difficult uh, to make money uh, as a lender, right? You're, you're borrowing short, lending long, and now you're, it's more costly in the short term than, than the long term. So uh, that then leads to, has to lead to some type of reduction in credit, and that would lead to a uh, recession. That's the causal link I would, yeah. uh, I would throw out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you can't make your, your bank, you make money on borrowing short term at a low rate and lending longer term at a higher rate. That's tied to the, the yield curve, the, the, right. the yield curve. And if the curve inverts, that means my borrowing costs rise above my lending, the return on my lending. And there I'm that's my profit margin. I can't make money. I don't lend. I don't extend credit. And the con credit's the mother's milk of economic activity. No credit, no, 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 nothing good's going on in the economy. That's right. Yeah. Right. There's also, I guess, the intuition might be also a signal, you know, kind of a sent, uh, what bond investors, the collective wisdom of bond investors, right? Sure. They're saying, they're saying, look, um, I, I, if I think there's a recession down the road, that means that inflation is going to fall, real yields are going to fall, long-term interest rates are going to fall. Uh, and so, uh, that drives down long-term rates relative to where short rates are, because that short rate is more tied to what the Fed's doing, and the Fed's got their foot on the on the brakes. That means higher short higher short-term interest rates, and you get that kind of inversion. So it's almost like the, a reflection of the collective wisdom of folks who think about these things for a living. They're putting their money where their mouth is, and presumably, they get it more right than well, they get it right every single time. In, in is it wisdom ways. or groupthink? Because when the because self wondering maybe too. Yeah, there's, right? that's yeah. that's the the thing with the yield curve. I think is more that, that's not appreciated enough. Is that when it inverts, people assume a recession is t coming, so we talk ourselves into a recession. So they listen to the bond market, and that affects the stock market, and then we just go to confidence weakens, and we just go around and around. That's interesting. Do you buy that argument, Eric? That we we talk ourselves into recession? That that just doesn't feel right to me. Look at Google Trends. 
yeah. yield curve searches. When the yield yeah. curve is close to inverting, it jumps. Yeah. Really? Everyone's looking, first of all, what the hell is the yield curve? And then we just talk ourselves into a recession. Huh. That's that's I find that so curious, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't I I don't know. That'd be an interesting uh, study to do. See if we can't figure you know kind of tease that out. You know, I, yeah, there must use be studies our, out there. I haven't seen we could, it. We could use measures of business confidence versus the yield curve, or Google yeah. Trends. There's lots of stuff we could do with it. Yeah, that would be very interesting. So, Eric, you said something in the middle. So, how do you define yourself? Are you like a yield curve agnostic? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm just I, I, exactly the point that I made. Like, I think. In the U.S., it works, but it doesn't work elsewhere. So you, you can't oh. really say, "Oh, the yield curve is is oh, a good oh, okay. indicator." Okay. Broadly speaking, it works for the U.S. Okay, so you're but, saying you're you're a U.S. yield curve believer? Sure. Okay. Well, sure means or, that wasn't a growing endorsement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the answer yes. Yes, yes. It, 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 okay. it, it works, right? Like it it seems yeah. to be a pretty accurate predictor until it. Yeah. Until it isn't. See, no, <laughs> well, until you go someplace else, right? Like I just, I, I, I think about what other countries are doing too, and then you can't you look at the yield curve to help you uh, assess what's going on there, right? So, right. All right. Well, I, so, all I have to say is all eyes on that yield curve. One thing I will say is important for folks that are thinking about looking at this as a, as an indicator of where the economy is headed, and I think they should. Is it? it I, I think it has to be what I would call a hard inversion in the yield curve. It can't be. The two-year yield rises above the ten-year yield intraday, or even for a week. Or it's got to be month two or three, and it's got to be not a basis point or two, but it feels like it's got to be 10, 15, 20 basis points at least, kind of an inversion. So it's got to be a clear inversion, not some you know uh, temporary thing you know, in, in the bond. See, Chris, see how he does it? He puts a yeah. lot of caveats on <laughs> no the caveats. inversion. Yeah. No, 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 no yeah, caveats. Caveat. I mean, although. Having that just said what I just said, I have not looked to see whether the curve has ever lightly inverted, not hard invert. You know, once it once it lightly inverts, does it always hard invert? Is there ever times where it hasn't done that? So there's been a couple of times. I think. Is there? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Great. So, so my question then is, does this condition the Fed's behavior at this point? Right. If you believe right. that the question. if you believe in this relationship, right, and it might be self fulfilling, right? We're not describing the causality do they does uh powell now say oh i'm not going to raise rates because that would cause the inversion what's yeah. your take well it, i think if i were on the fed and i needed a rule of thumb to kind of gauge what appropriate policy is i'd be looking at two things i'd be looking at, at this point in time i'd be looking at the 10-year two-year treasury spread that yield curve and I'd also be looking at my favorite measure of inflation expectations, which, by the way, has now changed. It's the ICE uh, measure. I don't know if you follow, but ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, just put out a uh, inflation expectations, uh, three of them, actually, daily, uh, based on inflation swaps. And I won't go into what that means, but also Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. I won't go into what that means, but combining them. And if you look at the one measure they have is of five-year inflation one year ahead. So not forget about inflation in the next year because that's influenced by what's going on right now. It's high. But look at a year from now and look at inflation in that five-year period. To me, that is, that's the key measure of inflation expectations. And that has risen quite considerably about as high as it's ever been. And I'd say for that measure, the key threshold is 3%. So if, if it rises above 3%, I'd say, you know, the, the Fed's not doing enough. It has to press on the brakes harder. But if the yield curve inverts, then they're pressing too hard and the economy is going to go into a recession. So those are the two governors. If I had, you know, a heuristic rule of thumbs I'd be using, it'd be those two things to try to gauge policy. And it may turn out to be the case you can't do both. You can't, there's no way to do it. The inflation expectations are too high and the yield curve is inverted. And then that says, oh boy, uh, you know, the plane's going to crash in all likelihood or a very high probability of crashing. Well, don't forget the Fed controls both ends of the yield curve now. Yeah. With quantitative easing. So they could actually try to use the balance sheet to raise the long term treasury yields to 10 year by, you know, not selling, but reducing the size of their balance sheet, their treasury hold more quickly, give them a little That's bit true. more breathing room. So, well, and that's the reason why people give for not believing in the yield curve today compared yeah. to 
That's past one of my time reasons. Because of the QE. That was that was your that's why you're the skeptic. Exactly. Yeah. You and there was no denier. reason we were going to have a recession. I, I do think you were a denier. And no, skeptic. Always a skeptic. You, you got into Chris's you know, church and somehow he turned you into a skeptic. I, mm -hmm. I, I feel that. No? <laughs> no. There, everything's documented on Economic View. <laughs> Everything I wrote about the yield curve uh, okay. leading up to the last time, oh, bashing oh, it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Very Here we good. can go back. All right. Okay. So you, you got on this, on this podcast, you got two believers, one skeptic and an agnostic. Or no, I, a you, U.S. 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 Believer. US believer. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. All right. One more thing that's really, uh, you know, kind of bothering me, and I just want to get your take on it, and then we're going to move on, play the game, the statistics game, and you know, kind of weave that into the, the broader discussion about geopolitical risk. Uh, and that is, um, are we at full employment? Um, so you saw the unemployment insurance claims. Hopefully I'm not taking anybody's statistic, but what were they? They were like 188,000. Is that what it was? 187. 187. Yeah, That's lowest since September, 1969. Oh my Lord. Uh, it, you know, in the unemployment rates, three, eight clearly falling. We've got a close to a record number of unfilled job positions. The quit rate and the percent of the labor force is quitting is very high. Wage growth is very strong. Are, are we at full employment? And the reason I ask is because the kind of the rules of thumbs that we often use to gauge that, say not quite, like the employment to population ratio, Ryan's favorite, EPOP for prime age workers, 25 to 54, that is still, I think it's 79 and a half percent, and it's gotta be well over 80, about a percentage point higher than it is today to be considered at full employment. Mm -hmm. So. The question to the group is, are we at full employment or not? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? What do you think? Eric, do you got a view? You don't have to have a view. No, no, I, I kind of do. Uh, my guess is not, even though the numbers are so strong, only because there are so many people who are still out of the labor force. Um, I, I don't know how many can get pulled back in. Right. Uh, because of the pandemic, you're saying. Because of the pandemic. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that that's the only thing that makes me say not yet. But but I'm more uh, the longer this goes on, the less I believe that that story. Like, it's hard to to keep saying that over and over again. And then. Yeah. Well, the other thing I just uh, looked at is if you look at the number of people that are not in the labor force. Uh, but say they want a job is still elevated compared to where it was pre-pandemic, but not by that much. I think it's like a half a million people or so, 750,000. So maybe a little bit, but not a lot. Ryan, what do you think? Are we at full employment? Not yet. And why do you How say far that? away? Hmm? Oh, prime EPOP. We still have, we can get up to what we saw in the late 1990s, early 2000s. To Eric's point, there, you know, there's still a lot of people that are not in the labor force, even though they say they may not want a job. If you look at those that are not in the labor force, uh, you know, for other reasons, like there, there's still a lot of shadow labor market slack that we can we can pull in. And at least since the 1960s, you know, labor force growth and nominal wage growth are very strongly correlated. And there's a causal relationship. So we should be able to start pulling more and more people in as nominal wage growth remains strong. So I, th I don't think we're, we're getting there, but I don't think we're there yet. Well, the chair Powell says the, he, I think he said the labor market is unhealthy, healthy, unhealthy. It's tight. It's so tight. It's unhealthy. So he would say we're at full employment. Would he, is that a fair characterization? I, I don't think he said the word full employment. I think he's he just not. saying it's unhealthy because okay. we, I think the issue is the labor supply problems and yeah. jobless claims are coming down rapidly because businesses aren't going to lay off workers because they know how hard it is to replace them. Yeah. Okay. So you're kind of like in, in uh, Chris's, in Eric's camp, and that is the pandemic has shoved all these people out. So it, the labor market is, I guess, for lack of a better term, artificially tight. You're correct. Yep. And as the pandemic fades, those folks come in and uh, the labor market, if it doesn't continue to improve, it would not, it would not go back. It's not at full employment then, you, right. you know, it's abstracting from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? Are we full employment? I, I'd agree. I I don't think we're there yet, but we're we're awfully close. Um, 
And the gate one gate, I, I agree with all the uh, explanations given another gauge I would throw out is just the um, income wages it does seem as though those are actually slowing in terms of growth rate. So that would suggest that there is more supply uh, coming in, keeping wages from really taking off. So I think, but uh, I think we're on that trend. I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll get more people in the labor market. There are plenty of jobs out there. Yeah. Uh, so if if we're not at full employment today, we're going to be there within a few months. Yeah, isn't our assumption by the end of the year that we're at full employment? Yeah, yeah. I think that's still reasonable. that a little bit, but yeah, yeah, certainly by year's end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's still reasonable. Makes assumption. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so those are things that are, are bothering me. Many things are bothering me, but we're running out of time. It's kind of like economic psychoanalysis, and I'm sure <laughs> I'm gonna one of these days I'm gonna turn to you and say what it's bothering you, but it's all about me, as you know, on this podcast. So uh, I needed that that bit of help. Let's play the game. The game is the statistics game. Uh, we each uh, provide a statistic. Uh, the rest of us try to figure out what that is through a series of questions. The best statistic is one where it's not too easy that we all get it so quickly, not too hard that we can't get it. And it would be nice if it's related to something that happened in the last week or related to the topic at hand, which is geopolitical risk. And I'm going to say right up front, I'm not playing the game. At least I'm not giving a statistic. And the only reason why is because I don't have one. I just, I came to this unprepared and I, cause I knew Eric had two. And actually I asked him if I could have one of his two statistics and he told me point blank, no. So I, you know, I found that a little, you know, What's the word? Well, you know, I have to have one in my back pocket. I don't know what you well, guys. Why are. the hell do you have to have one in the back pocket when I don't have any in my pocket? That's what I'm saying. Anyway, but that's fair enough. But I, I'm, I'm going to play the game because I, I play to win, you know. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to give. Very a competitive. <laughs> you know, Ryan pretends like he's not, but he is. He is. He's like, oh, really he's super. Oh, I'm very competitive. He's like super competitive, uber competitive. Oh, yes, I'm an extremely competitive person. Yeah. <laughs> right. He's my kind of economist. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, we got to make Ryan go first. All right. So, Because he's so good at this damn game. Okay, go ahead, Ryan. I'm going to guess his. What? Go for it. All right. Minus 2.2. .2. What is it? Minus 2.2%. No, I'm not going durable goods. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, no. that was a decline. In I, I, get a, I catch enough flack for bringing up durable goods on this podcast. So. I know he does that way <laughs> too many times. It's a great report. <laughs> it's subject to big revisions, but there's a lot of good information. That thing. It is. All right. well, do, do you now have to tell everybody what it said? It came out this week? Uh, I don't know. Maybe Chris is going into it. Like at the end, we can always come oh, back. That was to a head fake on go his Go ahead. Part. Go ahead. It's like a misdirect. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so durable goods. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, oh, you want me to give my number? All right, we'll forget durable goods. No, no, Here's no, my I, no, no. Wait, wait. <laughs> no. The whole world is now saying durable goods. Why is it so important? So give us the thumbnail. It's, quickly. it's a good. It's a monthly read on uh, orders, you know, uh, orders of various uh, durable goods. So we think aircrafts, autos, machinery, equipment, and also shipments and inventories. So a lot of this data feeds directly into GDP. Uh, so we have a good idea of what business investment and equipment is doing after we get the durable goods uh, data. So that's why I pay a lot of close attention to it because it matters for the GDP estimate and getting back to competitive that GDP number needs to be right. And if you ignore durable goods, you're not going to get it right. And so what happened to the tracking estimate for GDP for Q1? Came down. We were north of one, a hair north of one, like 1.1% at an annualized rate. And then after uh, durables and a few uh, new home sales, it came down to 0.8%. Oh boy. Wow. That's so we're flirting with zero. Right. I can just hear people now. This is stagflation. So that number comes out. stagflation. And that's what I'm, we're going to hear for sure. It's not stagflation. Like, by definition, stagflation is high inflation, high unemployment. Yeah. And well, they're going to I, say I'm more worried about stagflation this time next year if the Fed keeps doing what they're doing. Yeah. That sounds like a podcast. We should d go deep mm -hmm. into stagflation, talk about that, because that's people are hand wringing around that. Okay. Oh, so and we're playing. I think the everyone game. would We haven't even What's your number? Game yet. What's, yeah. All right. My number is, hold on, it just changed 70.5%. Oh, it, it just changed. Just changed. Just changed. Seventy point five. Okay, so, so he's looking this is at a the Bloomberg most important screen. development of the week. Most important development of the week in the U.S. Oh. for the U.S. for the U.S. economy. Oh. Is, oh. oh. 
it's not well it's got to be a financial market indicator because it just changed right yeah mm -hmm. okay well it's yeah it's determined within financial markets yep oh determined within financial <laughs> markets. we've talked about it on the podcast already there's a big hint is it around inflation expectations it is not uh you're getting there uh is it around probability of recessions yeah 70.5 percent probability of recession well, i'm just i'm just within okay, the next no. 10 years yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what i meant yeah, yeah, yeah no no that's not it years. no that can't that's be it, it. Uh, sentiment some sentiment measure no mm, nope no mm. tell me if you want a, a very obvious quote no don't give us to us okay. yet let's ask eric let's call eric out eric does anything come to mind you didn't know it's coming to mind right now oh, bummer chris what i mean it seems like we should be able to get it if it's the most important development mm -hmm. of the week and could be the most important okay i think i know i think i know it's the market's expectation for a 50 basis point hike in the funds rate at the next very week. good it's very good. Good. Oh, ding nice. ding 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 that's great i was just about to say that this is probably gonna be the biggest change to our forecast for the fed funds rate in a long time that we yeah, make no, you're coming okay. up. We, we got a lot to talk about there, guys. Because it's 70.5% yeah. for June, 61% yeah. probability of a 50 basis point hike in, uh, or no, that's for May, no, May 70.5. Right. June is 61% of a 50, 50 basis point. Yeah, so, I mean, they're telling us, you know, they're going to go to the neutral rate, with the neutral rate being that rate consistent with a full employment economy growing at potential with inflation, you know, headed towards target by the end of the year certainly mm -hmm. no later than this time next year and that's two Correct. and a half percent that's what they think it is that's what we think it is and they're probably going they're to 2.4 percent but just 2.4 yeah oh really they lowered it i thought it was they lowered high. it at the last meeting yep did they really that's weird but we're going to get there fast okay. so that means yeah i feel well, yeah so do you think by the end of the year or by by this time next year or what would you say all right i think the three of us are going to have an a lively Discussion debate around. coming up, but I think yeah. 50 in each of the next two meetings and then 25 yeah. at each of the uh, remaining meetings for the year. With the caveat that they, you know, they got to calibrate this so that they don't push us into recession, right? So right. again, I go back to the two indicators I would look at. I mean, if the curve starts inverting, but, but of course the curve reflects expectations. What you already, just right? said, right. right? Correct. So that's in bed. So the Fed would have to do even more than that, presumably. To invert it, yes. To invert it. Yeah. Okay. All right, so interesting. So I think they have it all clear to be really aggressive. I'm just worried that they, they do it too much. Yeah, right. Hey, Eric, did you see how that was done? That, that was masterful. That was masterful. Very good. Uh, it didn't mm -hmm. sound like he really meant it. Well, I've, I've heard you do this multiple times now on the podcast. So do I? Know I? How you Figure out these things. It's impressive. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, fair enough. Good enough. Okay. Uh, Eric, do you want Chris to go first or do you want to go next? Yeah, because mine's a good segue into the to into the topic. The topic. Yeah. Yeah. Good so his thinking. are gonna be impossible. And maybe. Yeah, oh, there you go. No. Yep. You know, it's You'll something about Ethiopia's dam or something fighting with Ethiopia. No, no. No, it's not gonna be that. The cost of coming water up like a... running through the 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 Aswan dam, you know, it's something per kilowatt hour. That's his that's his statistic. Mm -hmm. For the no, one it year, should be, it should be something that you guys all know, but but let Chris go first. All right, go ahead, Chris. You're all right, up. Go ahead, Chris. All right. Well, my my statistic was the UI claims for the week. Mm. So oh, sorry about that. We ran over. No, no problem. No problem. Well, it was impressive though. Uh, so I'll go with a backup. Uh, backup being housing. Point, what, what's that? Backup being housing. Minus four point one percent. Pending home sales. Yes. Oh, see, I know. Oh, sorry, pegged. Mark. I was supposed to let you so get a chance. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, they're so, pretty okay. bad. Well, that's a good one. Explain it. Go ahead. For, 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 that's a good one. Uh, pending home sales, right? Yeah. So, uh, indication of how many additional sales we'll have in, in future months. It's down uh, four point one percent on the month. Down five point four percent on the year. So. Direct correlation with, the, to, well, to my mind, direct correlation with the increase in, in interest rates uh, that we're experiencing. That's causing some softening here. Supply is still limited, so that's that's also a, a factor, uh, certainly. So, I think uh, housing market is certainly on the on the softer side going forward. Hey, 
you know, we talked about this last week with Ivy Zellman and Dennis McGill of Zellman Associates. Yep. I, I'm increasingly of the of the view that we're going to get some house price declines, and it's not going to be 18, 24 months from now. It's going to be, you know, sometime within the next year. Just given how, I mean, the rates are skyrocketing. This is, you know, fixed mortgage rates are going to be 5%, aren't they? Given we're 10-year, 10 10-year 10 yields stayed, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, they're at 2.5%, aren't they? Correct, today. They're up 13 basis points today. Yeah, so just add 1.5%. percent percent. We're going to be over 5 I, I think the affordability questions here are going to be massive, right? It's going to be binding, think? yep. So are you also coming to the conclusion that we might actually see some, certainly transactions are going to go through the floor. I would yes. think home sales are going to go through the floor because of affordability. And then I guess the only reason why you wouldn't see price declines is if investors keep buying, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the, the investor, other, other folks on the sidelines. Who, right? who would buy though? I mean, at these rates and these prices it just seems right. Well, I mean, I mean it, the lack of supply has kept people from buying. Yeah. Sure. Uh, even though they may have the cash or if they, they maybe want to buy and, you know, 5% is, is a higher mortgage rate, but still historically speaking, it's not that high. So if you are in that demographic, you're looking for a home and there's some more inventory coming along, you will see some some folks buying. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I agree I, with you. I think we're, we're certainly going to see softening yeah. here. Oh, yeah. Definitely certain markets are going to have some significant price declines. I don't know at the national level. Still, I think we'll yeah. get pretty close, but and we certainly could dip below zero, but yeah, it might it might uh, extend a little bit more. Well, that's another forecast we should really take a good hard look at. You know, yeah, in the for sure. Of these, these rising rates, yeah, just to make sure. What do you what do you think about existing home inventory down the road? Like a lot of people locked in very low mortgage rates over the last couple yeah. of years. Like, you know, for example, like my wife and I are like we're not going to move anytime no. soon unless like, yeah. mortgage rates have to go. Th- plummet yeah well so. ivy gave us a great statistic she said and I, it sounds consistent with our data 70 percent of homeowners with mortgages had coupons the the, the interest rate on their mortgage was less than four percent right and so if you're at five percent or plus i mean yeah. to make a move it's, it's a big cost yeah it's gonna be expensive yeah I mean, and with the remote work uh, possibility now even if you change jobs you don't need to, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. to move like you used to so right Okay. All right. Well, maybe that'll be something that'll be bothering me, you know, 12 months from now if we don't see some price declines because that just feels like it's coming. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was a good one. Okay. Uh, except it was Eric. entirely predictable. You know, Ryan's got you yeah. so pegged. I know. But no, that. there was two. It could have been new home sales or something in new home sales. It could have been pending. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Eric, you're up. And you got, right. you got two of them, you said? I've got two of them, but they're, they're, very unrelated. Um, oh. So, so I'm, oh. I'll just go with one first, and then we can we can we we'll can evaluate whether we want to get the second one or not. Is what that's right. <laughs> okay. So, three point seven two five million. That's the number of uh, people that have left Ukraine. Yep. Correct. But that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. It's a very good one. It's an important one. So, like, sure. give us a sense of of that, and uh, you know what the import of that is. Sure. So, uh, to date. 3.725 million uh, people have evacuated Ukraine, mostly going into Poland. 2.2 million people have uh, fled to Poland. Um, and, you know, they, they've sort of scattered to mostly the Eastern European um, countries. And eventually they are likely to sort of be spread out throughout Europe. To put that into context, um, in, in the 11 years uh, of refugees from Syria, which is roughly half the size of Ukraine, it's, it's on the order of 5.7 million people it's over 11 years. Wow. And this is 3.7 in, you know, a couple of weeks, oh, well, three, four weeks, right? So it's it, the, the scale of the number of people that are going to be moving through Europe is, is massive. And uh, being able to uh, take care of all of these people is going to be a, a real strain on many economies because they're mostly women and children. Um, they're not necessarily going to be joining the labor force right away. So it could be uh, a very tricky you know, situation. This is like so upsetting to watch this. It's, it's heartbreaking. incredibly upsetting. I can't even imagine what these people are going through. I guess the fortunate thing, at least from my, my observation, is that the world is embracing these uh, immigrants uh, that they're, you know, at least so far, right? 
Uh, they seem to be uh, ex being accepted. And very different from, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I've got it wrong, but my sense is that when we saw the uh, immigrants leave Syria, there was a lot of resistance to allowing them to come into Europe. Germany was probably the most welcoming, but that had all kinds of political backlash as a result of that. Uh, but this is very, very different. Uh, do I do I have that right, Eric, so far? I think that's right. It's also a very different situation, right? Syria was mostly an internal, you know, civil situation, whereas this is an invasion from an outsider coming, right? Like, so that that does make the, the, the situation a little bit different. There's a lot more uh, goodwill towards people who've been sort of attacked uh, from 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 abroad, um, it seems. Yeah, and they're going mostly so far to Eastern Europe, right? Poland, Correct. Uh, uh, well, as far as the tracking has been going, it's mostly been just tracking across the border. Uh, right. And okay, I guess the first stop. stop. What's that? It's first definitely stop. the first stop, but I know other countries are seeing an increasing volume of, of uh, refugees as well. I know Italy is taking in a lot, and Spain, France. I mean, they're they're starting to move further and further around. Right. When I know the U.S., President Biden just announced that the U.S. would accept 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. I guess that might be just the first uh, yeah. uh, group. I would hope that's the first yeah, wave. Yeah, I would hope it's the first right? yeah. On, yeah. on this scale. Right. Yeah, I mean, it feels like this could be really a problem, right, for everyone involved because there's how many... 45, 50 million Ukrainians, right? And it feels like this could, there could be millions and millions of more, maybe tens of millions of Ukrainians that have, are displaced by all this. Some of the initial estimates was that were that about 10 million or so uh, refugees would will result. likely result, yeah. Right. right. And well. given the pace of the Russian economy is whether well, it could be Russian economic refugees. I don't know. Yeah, how they'll be viewed, right? But it, it could be even larger than what we're talking about here. The well, current estimates for Russia are around two hundred thousand. It, it's not at this at this point, point right? Um, yeah, right, but, exactly. And is that is that uh, is. folks that are dissidents or people that just object and they want out of there, or what? What, what is it because of economic reasons they're leaving, or what is what is uh, that? I'm, I'm not. A, I don't have a clarity on on why. Yeah. And again, these are just estimates based off of. I yeah. think mostly anecdotal stuff. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, you hear, you do hear stories of a brain drain, right? So from Russia, from Russia tech workers yeah. that can get out or are leaving cuz they don't see a future. Uh, yeah, you would think. I mean, given you can see just the crackdown on um, you know, just free thought, free speech, media, political discourse, you know, it, this can't be conducive to keeping the best and the brightest in your country, right? It can't be. No. Oh. Right. Okay. Let me ask you uh, again a question, Eric, that you, you may or not may or may not know the answer to. I'm just going to ask it anyway. It feels like, and this maybe go back goes back to some degree to Ryan's geopolitical risk indicator, but I'm asking kind of more subjectively. Does it feel like there's more geopolitical risk now than there typically is? I mean, but there's all there's always <laughs> something somewhere feels like it's going off the rails. Uh, there's always risk, geopolitical flashpoints. But to you, you know, as an observer of this, careful observer of this, does it feel like it's more pronounced than it has been at you know other points in history? I don't I, scale wise. I don't think it's you know off the charts, uh, you know, are higher than it's been in the past. But I, I, I would say it's elevated, uh, largely because when we had the sort of pandemic running into this already, which was already causing tensions between countries um, for, for various reasons. Um, and then now that you have something on this scale, and uh, it really does sort of, one, the, the biggest issue, the, the thing that you ask, what are people worried about? The thing that I'm worried about is that everybody's got their eye on Russia and Ukraine, uh, they may not see all the other things that are normally going on and sort of historical uh, tensions that are about. So India, Pakistan, um, Israel, Palestine, um, all of these things that are just, they're just there always. And, and they sort of have that baseline geopolitical risk there. 
um, we're elevated above that. And I'm worried that you sort of, somebody forgets about that and something else happens in the background. So, so, so broadly, it doesn't feel like there's the, the level of geopolitical threats risk out there is it's on the high side, but it's not, it's, it's on the high side, but it's not alarm bells ringing, uh, at least not yet. Right. It, it really depends on what ends up happening with Russia, like how how hard they keep going and how what the rest of the world's reaction is the, the longer the conflict gets drawn out. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the uh, sticking to Russia, Ukraine just for a little bit, because obviously that's kind of top of mind here as it should be. Uh, there's just so many moving parts to this in, in terms of the sanction, in terms of what Russia has been doing, what Russia has done and is doing, in the response from the rest of the world to what they're doing, of all the of all the things of all the sanctions that have been put in place, do you think any are particularly important from a geopolitical perspective? At least, both thinking about this in the near term and longer run, is there anything that kind of stands out as unusual or going to have more of an impact going forward? Uh, I think the biggest one is probably the the freeze on central bank assets, uh, of Russia's central bank assets. Um, it, it's not that countries haven't done that before. So this happened with Syria. Um, it's happened with, but but mostly smaller players. Can I, right? can this I just is stop the, just just to make clear, sure I understand sure. what you're talking about? You're talking about the freezing of the, the Russian reserves. Is that what you're talking Russian about? Russian reserves. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So Russia had how, what 650 billion in basically cash in the yeah. bank that they collected over the years from selling their oil and they had a, a surplus in their current account. So they get they got money and they put into 650 billion. But of, of that 350, 400 billion, I'm making that up, but it's roughly right, is in dollars, yen, euro, pounds, and the US, UK, Japan, the EU froze those accounts. So that cash the Russians can no longer get to that cash. Is that is that that's what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, all right. So and you're saying that's a big deal. I think it is right. So it, it's more just that that threat is now out there for even bigger players, right? So you know, before you know, if someone does that to Syria or something like that, that's one thing. Um, I think it the the threat of it being out there it just says that there are more policy tools out there for sanctions from the point of view from sanctions than, than in the past. So. What do you think it means in terms of uh, the dollar's reserve currency status? So the dollar is the, uh, I think probably accounts for, I think 75, 80% of all reserves uh, because it, it, you know, it's the bulk of uh, global trade is still done in dollars. Uh, oil trade you know, for the most part is still done in dollars. And that, that, status uh, of, of being a reserve currency has tremendous that gives us tremendous economic benefits one of which is what we just saw the u.s can exercise significant power by freezing you know those dollar reserves uh and influence um uh, uh policy you know political uh, political decisions and and uh, policy decisions based on that power but by exercising that power, it signals to everyone that, well, these reserves are under U.S. control effectively at the end of the day. If you do something that the U.S. doesn't agree with, they can freeze, the U.S. can freeze those assets. So do you think that means that it uh, degrades the viability of the dollar as a reserve currency? I think it's going to be pretty hard to shape the dollar as a reserve currency. Um, maybe on the margin slightly, but I, I doubt it. And one of the reasons why is that it, it wasn't the United States acting unilaterally, right? They, were, they weren't the only central bank to do this. And so it, it's, not as, um, it's not as if they're just being punitive and um, you know, sort of saying this to everyone. It, it's really the central banks as a whole are imposing these sanctions on Russia. Um, so I, from that perspective, um, Maybe there are a few places that are a little bit worried about it, but I don't think in the grand scheme of things, it's enough to shake off the dollar status as a reserve currency. Yeah. What do you think, Chris? Same same kind of sense of that? Yeah, I'd agree. I agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Ryan, any any other 
No objections. No. Okay. Uh, okay. Any any other of the sanctions that stand out, or anything the Russians have done that stands out to you in terms of something that's just particularly unusual, or I mean, the scale is unusual, obviously. Uh, yeah. The the scale and the the speed with which everything went into place, right? I, that's what I found actually pretty impressive. That and and the the one of the bigger things that I think is less mentioned though is how quickly multinational firms have responded um i don't know how long that will last right so that they have responded to these kinds of situations before and relatively quickly have sort of stepped back again but uh you know it, i was I, I was sort of surprised at how quickly it's all sort of been put into place you know i wonder if uh the fact that uh these conflicts now are front and center you know we can see real time what's going on i mean i saw this <clears throat> amazing video uh, that someone was taking from their phone that showed you know russian troops coming up to an apartment building coming into the apartment coming right up to the person's door knocking or i don't know if they were knocking they wanted to get in and you could you could watch this real time and they had a huge machine gun that they were bringing into the apartment building and the fact that you can see that and you you can feel it viscerally means that people you you know employees of companies are going to say, hey, this is not good. And I don't want to be part of a company that has anything to do with this. So that going forward, this becomes kind of more standard operating procedure. You know, if someone does, you know, does something like this and, and you can see it, that that uh, you're, you're going to see this kind of reaction from the private sector because, it, you know, it is so front and center. I wonder if that's a new dynamic that's going to play out going forward. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I mean. That's one of the surprising things. Yeah. And, and again, the speed with which that happened, uh, largely owing to to videos like what you yeah. were describing. Now, so the self-sanctioning ask... is what you're talking about, right? Yes, yes. The non-governmental, right? That exactly. We could buy oil. It's not, <laughs> it's, right. not uh, it's not illegal, uh, but um, you have companies choosing not to, right? Well, you just saw the rating agencies, Moody's just announced, I think yesterday uh, that, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday mm -hmm. that they pulled ratings on Russian companies, r Russian debt. Um, so just another example of that. Um, okay, so uh, another aspect of Russia, Ukraine and the geopolitical risk is uh, China. <clears throat> China has been seemingly supportive of what the Russians are doing, or at least providing some financial support to what the Russians are doing. Um, how do you think this changes uh, this event in Russia, China's support for Russia changes the dynamic, the pretty vexed dynamic between the U.S. and China? Do you think it has an impact, or you know, what what kind of fallout will that uh, play uh, have? It, it almost seems as if it's a continuation on what was already happening, which was sort of this decoupling of the U.S. and China, and and you know, sort of spheres of influence developing on on either side there. Um, I, my hope, I don't know if this is going to work out so well, but again, because of how quickly the sanctions were put in place, how much of it was multinational firm self-sanctioning, that may give China, I, I would think, a little bit more pause in some of their more aggressive foreign policy uh, types of actions. Um, because, you know, if they step too far out of line from what people find acceptable, like Putin did in Ukraine, um, then, you know, you, they might find themselves in a really tricky spot and, and ice, more isolated than they expect. Yeah, this does bring up a broader point. Uh, and this is a dynamic that was uh, occurring even before Russia invaded Ukraine. And this is uh, this decoupling that you, you mentioned. So, you know, uh, I think it's fair to say that between the time China entered into the World Trade Organization in, in 2001, up and through pretty much the financial crisis, uh, that uh, and re even beyond that to some degree, in the 90s, we, you know, we saw this increasing globalization of the economy, more global trade, more global foreign investment, FDI, foreign direct investment, as well as you know, investments in, in uh, debt securities and equity. Uh, immigration, uh, all these things seem to be accelerating. And they, I think it's fair to say, and I'm curious if you think you have a different take on it, that it was a, a, a net positive for the global economy, 
It, it certainly lifted hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people out of poverty in places like China and, and other emerging economies. Uh, but it also helped to fuel growth. Now, there was winners and losers, you know, from all this. And, of course, there's, there was a backlash to that. And that's what we uh, have been observing, you know, ever since. You know, uh, President Trump would be, you know, a good example of that backlash, similar kind of di uh, political dynamic in other countries. And now, and now China and our pushback on China feels like we are going in the opposite direction. Or certainly the, 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 global, the increase in globalization has come to an end. Is that, do you think that's a fair characterization of how things have played out and where we're headed? Uh, I think it's a great characterization. I, that was actually my other statistic to a certain oh, degree. Oh, okay. What was so, that? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll say the statistic first because I think it's worth seeing whether you guys can get this one because this one's a lot harder than, yeah. than my other one. We it's 30.5%. And I'll, I'll even give you, it's a, a percentage of GDP, but I won't tell Is you. Is that global trade as a percent of GDP? Imports as a percentage of GDP, 30.5% 30 30 in uh, before the pandemic, so 2019 Q1. Okay. Uh, Ryan, did you see how that was done? I mean, I'm not even going to I think you guys are in cahoots. What's that? <laughs> I think you guys are emailing beforehand. <laughs> no. I'm very skeptical of that no. one. That, one, that one's but, impressive. But, That's impressive. That was very impressive. Uh, yes. and, and, and so, because Eric thought that was a hard one. Yeah. I, I did. Exactly. Well, we were we were sort of going there in the conversation. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. So you, there were Welfare there was a list that you had of like four or five things that you could yeah. have gone to. I think. All point. right. But if you notice, um, like, throughout the podcast, you started off cold, then you warmed up, and now recently you've been on fire. So I'm wondering what's going on. <laughs> we're going to have to launch well, it's conspiracy uh, theories. Yeah. Yeah. This is how it starts. You know, <laughs> this is how it starts. He, He's denying the world with the yield curve. He's uh, looking for conspiracies everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> now it starts. Anyway, so uh, what do you do? You, how do you think this is going to play out? I mean, do you think the U.S. and China are going to decouple here, uh, continue to decouple? How, how do you how do you think this is going to play out? And what is the import of that? We'll circle back to that, but I do want to talk about the globalization bit. So, so oh, the, yeah, sure. the statistic is just, you know, the most recent value that we have, given the number of economies that we cover. Um, but what's really interesting about it is the value in 2001 was 22.8, 23%, say. Okay? The, that went up to 28.7% in 2008. And it's only gone up another 2% since then. So basically, it went gangbusters between 2001 and uh, the financial crisis, right? So globalization was taking off exactly to your point. And then it's basically sort of flatlined a little bit and sort of tapered off post-financial crisis um, to this idea of, you know, decoupling and, and some of the other sort of more... Uh, countries have, have become more inward looking instead of outside because of some of these, uh, you know, uh, some of the differences between who were the winners and the losers in this real quick globalization push. Yeah, right. And do you think the, the deglobalization, the decoupling, is that, you expect that to continue? So I think certainly the direct links between U.S. and China will probably sever more. That that would be my best guess, you know. Uh, but globalization itself, in terms of like the interconnectedness of all the economies, will probably continue to increase just at a slower pace. I mean, it's really hard to get that genie out of the back into the bottle, right? Like one, once people start having the internet and have seeing other people with things that they want to, somebody's going to figure out a way to make that happen. Um, so uh, it, it strikes me, particularly with work from anywhere, right? Like there, there are just too many things that are driving globalization. It may go more slowly. Uh, firms may be more cautious given supply chain problems, right? All of these things, I think, put, you know, put the brakes on a little bit. But don't don't stop globalization from progressing. Yeah, no, my sense is that uh, you know, at least for the foreseeable future. When I say that, the next few years, at least, it, I, I just I don't think there's any any stopping this decoupling that's going on. Uh, 
you know, the pandemic just reinforced it. I mean, as you pointed out, the supply chains, they're coming back in and governments are very focused on trying to ensure that they have uh, what they need in their borders or pretty close. You know, if it's not in the U.S., it's got to be in Canada, maybe Mexico, uh, because, uh, you know, for things like chips, you know, like, like chip manufacturing would be the, kind of the poster child for this. But other, other you know, important sophisticated instrumentation, pharmaceuticals, other key strategic metals, that kind of thing. I just think there's just no going back. And then uh, China's, you know, China's feels like it's going to be a problem. Uh, there's a lot of issues there around intellectual property, access to markets, cybersecurity. Uh, it, it just doesn't feel, and then we've got all the tensions around Taiwan and Hong Kong, lesser degree Hong Kong now, the Uyghurs, civil uh, uh, human rights. It just feels like to me that there's, uh, that this is uh, this, this decoupling will continue for the foreseeable future, and to the extent that, not that I think it's a good thing. I think it's you know it's unfortunate because I do believe that globalization is a, a huge positive for the global economy, but I think we need to embrace it at this point and figure out how to do it in a way that is least damaging and you know as graceful as possible. We just have to. It's just the reality of the situation that we're in at this point, and we've got to figure out how to do it. The best way possible. Any any com any response to that view? No, I think that's a. I basically agree, right? So yep. what I mean is when when I say decoupling, when I hear you say decoupling, I think you're thinking specifically of China and U.S. Right? Those specific tensions are mostly, those specific mostly, links. But, yeah, mostly. Yeah, because that's the other. Uh, yeah, you make a good point because it could result in increased relationship strengthening of. Our global ties with uh, our, uh, our trading partners in in Europe, for example. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or even Latin America. Well, and and in in Latin America and in Africa, right? As sources yeah. of raw materials. Point. <clears throat> okay, let's because uh, we're running out of time. Uh, maybe I thought we'd end the conversation this way. Each of us uh, identify a a current geopolitical risk or threat that's kind of top of mind. Uh, for them, what they think is, you know, particularly important that you know, it's certainly been in the news, all these things have been in the news, or maybe you have one that isn't in the news that you think we should focus on as potentially being an issue or a problem, or at least highlighting something that's going on that's important. Does that sound like a reasonable way to end the conversation? Okay. And sure. and maybe I should begin with you, Eric, I'll go with you first. So uh, who, what would you point to? Uh, 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 what geopolitical risks do you think we should be focused on that we're not? So uh, I think there are a lot. I, I, I think almost all of them revolve in some sense around what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, because it is very disruptive and it's sort of pressuring uh, other countries to act in different ways that they may otherwise not have. Um, so I think that that's uh, really important to sort of state at the outset. Uh, and I'm sure everyone's going to have something that's somewhat uh, related. Um, so uh, I think the refugee situation is probably going to be the biggest situation for the next, um, say, three years, at least, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's just about navigating where all of these people are going to be going, how do they, you integrate them to the into the, you know, host country and what's going and how did the countries decide who gets which refugees it's it's that's a huge uh political minefield um and and it's something that we should all be sort of watching and paying attention to okay okay fair enough uh ryan what what is uh the geopolitical hotspot threat that you would point to like we would would nato in ukraine and nato in russia would that apply? Is it? Would you consider that a geopolitical hotspot? Sure. Yeah, because yeah, you know whether or not NATO accepts Ukraine, that would have enormous implications for the relationships with Russia and everything like that. Yep, yep, that would be a good one. Okay, uh, Chris. The top of mind for me is actually uh, food, food prices, right? Fallout from the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis on fertilizers on. All, all sorts of crop prices, I think this could have significant global uh, repercussions, right? We have countries in the Middle East that depend directly on your, Ukraine uh, 
wheat from the Ukraine, and it's not clear that they'll be able to get a sufficient harvest this year. And then just the ripple effects, just all prices are up everywhere. And that's, that's good. That certainly could uh, spark some both domestic and international tensions between countries. There was talk of food shortages at the, the NATO conference. Where yeah, I, th- I think it's very real. So yeah, they said the possibility of global food shortages. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there's uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but you know, to give a rough order of magnitude, there's, I think, 50 countries across the globe, roughly, that get more than a third of their uh, grain exports from Russia and Ukraine. So, and those, yeah. those exports aren't going to be happening to a significant degree. So that is a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, the one that comes to mind to me and it's related is uh, Iran. Uh, the it's Iranian, uh, we've had a lot of trouble with Iran over the years and we've had an agreement that the that Obama administration agreed to, Trump uh, canceled that agreement. And it feels like uh, we're gonna get another agreement on uh, Iranian uh, nuclear development. Uh, and if we get a deal, that, that could be key, critical, kind of a game changer because the Iranians can export, I believe up to two, two and a half million barrels of oil a day. And if that oil starts to flow in earnest, that could make a big deal to, that could be a big deal to oil prices. Which you know, going back to the start of our conversation, that is you know really a, a significant factor for what's going on here in our economy and everything else. So that would be, I think, uh, there's a lot of n- potential negative geopolitical risks and threats, but that would be a potential positive upside. You know, if we actually get that. So another no, no positive one. On it, but we could get yeah, another positive one is that maybe this global, uh, you know, a number of countries becoming more unified, working together. The UK and the US reduce their tariffs on one another. So maybe the US that. and yeah. Canada can work out a deal on, you know, softwood lumber. So hopefully this use of tariffs starts to to diminish. Yeah, we could be underestimating how uh, how much this brings uh, the, the, the rest of the world together and working right. together. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's a good point. Okay, very good. Uh, Eric, uh, just an open ended question before we end. Anything I missed? Anything you want to bring up? Uh, when it when it comes to, to risk, I know that's a that's key to folks that look at geopolitical risk, the unknown unknown. So, what's the unknown thing that I didn't ask you about? Well, I, I think I think the big thing is just, uh, and again, the thing that I'm worrying about the most is that people are focusing so much on Russia and Ukraine, they the, that something else slips through, and it's usually going to be in a place that we don't talk about too much, right? So that that's that's the thing that I sort of worry about, but. And what are they? You don't Just know where that's going to Quick, three things. What what are they? What should what are? Oh, they? Uh, India and Pakistan, um, okay. Ethiopia and um, uh, Egypt, uh, which uh, they're they're building a dam in Ethiopia, which is affecting the waters that flow through the Nile into Egypt. Which Egypt, uh, speaking about wheat, pulls in seventy yep. percent of their wheat from Russia, Ukraine. So they're in a tight, tight spot. So those are the two big ones. That two I big think. ones. Okay, very good. Okay, so guys, uh, we're going to implement a new uh, feature on uh, our podcast, and that is we are going to start answering some questions. So uh, from from listeners, you know, this is this is somebody who follows me on Twitter. Oh, by the way, at Mark Zandi, at Mark Zandi. Uh, you can pose questions there uh, and or economy.com or help at economy.com or you know how to reach us. Just, you know, let us know your question. So here's the question. And, it, and, and it, this is going back to last week's podcast on housing markets. And this is probably how it's going to work. We're going to do a podcast. People are going to ask questions. And next week we'll take the, the, the you know, one of the questions and, and resp- or two of the questions and respond to it. And I, th- I thought this was a good question. It's about uh, here. I'll just read it. Uh, the person says, interesting discussion. This is about the podcast like, so last week on housing with, with Ivy Zellman and Dennis McGill. At times, I got lost trying to understand what signals we should be watching out that will help define the overall markets, and they mean the housing markets, direction. You folks see so much data that we as average investors can't keep up with. Can you just give me a few key indicators uh, that, that would be helpful to watch to gauge what's going on in the housing market? What do you think, Chris? What would you point to? I think it's a great question. I think it depends a little bit on your horizon. So if we're thinking about longer term or underlying fundamental trends and looking at demographic data, household formations, population growth, 
uh, immigration, right? Those would certainly be the factors that would determine um, how much housing we should have. Actually, one of my favorite measures that very few people look at is just the ratio of housing stock to population or housing stock to households, right? That you would assume that there would be some type of equilibrium there. And we can see that those in the measures are elevated right now. But shorter term, right? Uh, I'm certainly looking at some of the measures that we, we cover on the podcast, like the pending sales, right? If you want to get a sense of what the direction is uh, going forward, looking at interest rates, uh, certainly. And then if you're looking at uh, just construction supply demand dynamics, right? how, many, how many households are being formed currently versus the uh, amount of construction that we are creating at the moment, uh, some estimate perhaps of second homes and lost homes, right? To get a, a sense of how much uh, underlying demand is there versus uh, the amount of supply that's coming. I don't know, Mark, what, what's your take? Um, I would say simply the mortgage rate um, and the change in the mortgage rate. And I have in my mind that in the long run, <clears throat> When everything is functioning appropriately, the mortgage rate should be somewhere between five and a half and six percent. We're still well below that, but so you know, it's the the level is still low by historical standards. But it's also the change that matters. Uh, yep. And so we we were below three percent on the fixed mortgage. In fact, we were as low as two six five, I think, back at the low during parts of the pandemic. And you you know, it's, so it's almost doubled since then, or will soon be doubled. That in a very short period of time, that's going to do a lot of damage. So I think that's a pretty good leading indicator of where the housing market is headed over the next uh, six, 12 months. So watch out for the the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. I, I look at the Freddie Mac rate uh, that comes out every week. You can go to Freddie Mac's website and you can see it uh, plain as day. And uh, to me, that at this point, at this juncture in the business cycle, in the housing cycle, that's the indicator to watch. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would add to that, uh, just in terms of speculation, right? There, we have some other measures we look at in terms of flips and investor activity, right? So, if you're if you're looking at something or you want to get a sense of what's happening in the in the near term, right? I would certainly pay attention to some of those other uh, indicators that we've been tracking. So. Got it. Okay, very good. Uh, what do you think? That's a good idea. This new feature to answer a question. You think it's a good? I like idea? it. Yeah, like it? Okay. absolutely. All right, we'll see what the we, folks out there, listeners, tell us what you think uh, and, and fire away with questions. We're, and by the way, I, I did not give these guys this question in advance. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no. we're not doing that. Um, but anyway, um, okay, with that, we're going to call it a podcast. Thank you, everyone.